Welcome to the Lathe Soft Jaw video series, brought to you by Haas Automation. Soft jaws offer several benefits not provided by hard jaws. They align the workpiece exactly to the spindle center every time and locate the back face precisely. They are required when holding difficult shapes and any part that must be made accurately. Today, we are joined by Andrew, one of our Haas certified technicians. In this video, we will demonstrate the proper way to cut OD gripping soft jaws and cover soft jaw fundamentals. The first side of this bearing housing has been completed. We will show you our recommended soft jaw cutting methods as we make the jaws to hold the finished first side of this part. Soft jaws will allow us to maintain the best concentricity to the accurate surfaces we've already machined. Before we start cutting, let's go over some soft jaw fundamentals. First, we need to choose whether we'll use aluminum or steel jaws. Aluminum jaws are typically used to grip light weight or hollow parts where clamp force is low. Steel jaws will be used where clamping forces are higher and jaw longevity is important. Second, it's important to choose the right sized jaw. Soft jaws are available in a few different sizes. When choosing a jaw, it is recommended that you hold at least one third of the workpiece length. For a tall part, we can hold the recommended one third length with a taller jaw. And for a smaller part, we can still hold one third of the part with a small jaw. As the jaw height increases and the part moves away from the chuck face, the clamping force on the part naturally decreases. If the clamping pressure is set too high in an attempt to increase the clamping force, the soft jaws will be distorted, actually decreasing grip force. And the additional leverage from the longer jaws can overload and damage the chuck. Instead, refer to your chuck documentation to find a balance between grip center height and clamping force. Before we mount the jaws, it's a good idea to clean the serrated faces of the soft jaws and master jaws and the T-slots as well. While we are working at the chuck face, it is worth noting that you should never operate the chuck with the cover plate removed in an attempt to gain additional part clearance. This cover protects the internal moving parts from contamination. If contamination occurs, chuck life can be significantly reduced. You can mount your jaws in a variety of positions. But we chose this position in order to conserve our jaw thickness since we plan to reuse these in the future. Never position the jaw T-nuts outside of the edge of the chuck body. When first mounting the jaws, it's a good idea to set them out as far as possible, just as a starting point. Andrew positions the jaws outwards until the T-nuts are near the edge of the chuck body. When attaching the uncut jaws to the chuck, always torque the jaws in place and refer to the chuck documentation for the correct torque value. In our case, Andrew will torque the M12 bolts holding these steel jaws to 80 foot-pounds. Use a smaller torque value for aluminum jaws to avoid distorting the screw seats. It is also extremely important to lubricate the chuck once a day using two or three pumps of grease per jaw. Use Chucky's grease or an equivalent boundary lubricant with a high percentage of molybdenum disulfide. If you aren't lubricating the chuck every day using this specific type of grease, clamping force can diminish by 50% or more. When machining soft jaws, they must be clamped tightly against some type of object. One of the best ways to keep soft jaws in position for cutting is to use an adjustable boring ring. The boring ring has three adjustable dowels that are meant to be inserted into the jaw screw holes. These slide along the slotted ring body during adjustment and lock in place against the ring when the jaws are clamped. This design allows for slight changes in clamping position to be made easily. When the soft jaws are held tight for cutting, the master jaws should be at the middle of their travel, 
the chuck clamps most efficiently at this middle travel position. This also allows for adequate clearance when loading parts and for variations in workpiece size when the jaws are used later in production. On Andrew's initial ring placement, we see that he is clamped at the very top of travel. Machining the jaws at this high stroke position would make part loading very difficult, since the jaws would only open a fraction larger than the part size. Conversely, if Andrew were to machine the jaws at a low stroke position, the result would be jaws that have very little travel remaining to grip the part past the nominal diameter. In order to clamp in the desired center of stroke, Andrew unclamps the jaws and rotates the boring ring body slightly, counterclockwise to bring the adjustable dowels inward slightly. The boring ring is now clamped at the center of the stroke. As you look at your setup, visualize the direction you will be clamping in. Always be sure to clamp with the jaws against the boring ring in the same direction that you will hold the workpiece. Also visualize the amount of force you will be clamping with. During jaw cutting, clamp the jaws with a force as close as possible to your planned part gripping force. As a basic rule, adjustable boring rings can be used up to 100 PSI maximum pressure and 900 RPM maximum speed, but don't exceed the manufacturer's specifications. In our case, we will be clamping the part at 130 PSI and the jaws at 100 PSI. The difference of 30 PSI between these two pressures is not enough to cause problems on this particular part. Keep in mind that there are many situations where you will need to clamp your workpiece at a pressure much higher than your boring ring will allow. We will address that scenario in another video in this series.